I grew up in a little town, Emerson, New Jersey. I just got out of high school when World War II broke out. I had nine brothers and sisters, and I volunteered to go into the service. Went to basic training in Camp Croft, South Carolina. 13 weeks basic training, then to Patrick Henry on board ship, one one day trip on a, a Liberty ship, Samuel Ash. It was a, a heck of a ride because the ships were made in weeks they were built. Mm -hmm. But with 21 days of seasickness, <laughs> I landed in Oran, North Africa. We were on bunks, hardly any room, very little exercise because there was no room on the ship. Mm -hmm. and we, almost like a prisoner of war for 21 days, waiting to be hit by submarines which followed us all the way overseas. Africa was only a staging area. We boarded ship and went over to, to Italy. Sicily, then Italy. At that camp, they were picking different outfits that we had to be Put into. Most of my men went into the infantry and we were asked at that time we needed 25 men to join the 45th Infantry Cavalry Reconnaissance Troop. At that time I volunteered for the Cavalry Reconnaissance Troop. Originally <clears throat> the insignia of my outfit, the 45th Infantry Division, was a SWAT sticker. When Hitler declared war, right, they had a chance. They didn't want to wear the swastika, of course. Of course. So what they did, the Indians came up with the Thunderbird. A few days later was my first mission, and they had me in demolition, which I never had any training for, and, and it wasn't an easy task. We were taking, building up our convoy, for the invasion, which takes time. So I'm figuring we're going to be on board ship for three or four days. As a little crazy American soldier, I decided I'm only about a quarter of a mile or less off the Isle of Capri. So alone, I jumped overboard, swam to the Isle of Capri, combat boots, everything on. And I went there and had a knife of entertaining myself, a woman, drinking and whatever. The next morning, when I come back to the beach, I was gonna swim back, but my ship was gone. It was, it was displaced in the convoy. Now, a little frightened American, 18 year old, I'm standing on a beach, realizing that I could be uh, a deserter. And I see a, a Navy skiff coming in. My comrades on board ship had told, told them that I had jumped ship the night before. So the Navy was coming in for me. And this is the happiest time I've ever saw military police. They picked me up. I was ushered up to the Admiral of the ship. 
and he, he said, you know, you could be a deserter and you're going, you're going to go into Brig. So I figured after invasions before, I'm not really ready for another invasion. So I said, well, at least I'll be safe in the Brig. So we said, well, with that attitude, you're going to be the first one off the ship in a rubber raft, go to, to the beach and set up this banner marking the spot where your outfit is supposed to land. Anzio was, luckily, it wasn't an easy invasion, but it's an awful feeling mm. being in the middle with the German artillery going over your head and the American battleships oh, the artillery going the other way. Well, you just dug in the sand as much as you can. You said the Lord's <laughs> Prayer many times. Your, my officer, a lieutenant, was a real George Patton of our, my outfit. Mm -hmm. He was a, a true soldier, a true officer, would give his life at any time. And he was given the charge of, a, of a, a suicide mission that was up, going to be our patrol that morning, a mechanized mission. We were supposed to go down the road and drive right in front of the German army and draw fire because the next day was going to be the breakthrough of Anzio. And we had to find out as guinea pigs how much flack we took out of that German front line. And unfortunately, the, the vehicle in front of me, which was, was the lieutenant and two of my buddies, they hit a double landmine, which blew that cheap in pieces. The three men were, were killed, including the lieutenant. So uh, the, the second lieutenant in charge ordered us turn around and go back, mm. that we accomplished what we, mm. what we saw. One, one experience over there was we were taking the little town of Pizzilli. It was a, a small Italian town. Mm -hmm. And a, a German artillery shell coming in, hit the building, set it on fire. Well, looking at a little girl up, up there, with her, she was on fire. I told the guys, they gave me cover, grabbed a blanket, ran across the street up there, and put the fire up, put the, wrapped the girl in fire put the fire, uh, saved her from the fire, took her down, and I called in an ambulance, American ambulance, put her in the ambulance, and I didn't see the girl again, but I found out from the family that she survived everything. And uh, I met her quite a few years later when I went back to a trip to see the family. And until from the day that accident happened, they kept contact with my mother until the day my mother passed away. This is my salary in World War II, $6.50 a month. My mother got the rest. That's all I kept for me. 25 years after the war, 30 years, that somebody met oh, somebody right. in the museum in Oklahoma. And he said, do you know anybody in this picture? He said, I know that guy. <laughs> and there he was. And then he sent it to me. And I said, yeah, that's me, that's my, that's my Jeep I drove that. I love this picture of him. <laughs> that's when I met my brother. All this time, it's probably two years already, in, in the service, never had a vacation, never had a furlough, all through the war. And, which I'm very proud of, my outfit spent 511 combat days in World War II. That is a record, which I'm proud of. And, uh, well, I, I spoke to my commanding officer, and I said, I've never had a furlough, but my brother, I had read in the Army newspaper that my brother was stationed a few hundred, within a few, 200 miles of where I was at the time. So it's okay, he said, and he gave me a Jeep. 
And uh, at that time, we were, we were near uh, in France, a cheese factory with, where I filled up the Jeep, the cheese, which weighs probably close to 50 pounds, uh, sardines that the Germans, that was there, that, that was the food for the Germans, mostly sardines, which I, I like. And I, I put up three cases of sardines, which we had captured from the Germans in my Jeep, plus a gallon of three-star cognac, which is a very good cognac in France. I went to see my brother. I'm on the way to my brother. I make, I make a, a wrong turn, and I'm going up a hill, and there I look right in the front of me, about a 37 millimeter cannon was directly at me. Well, I said, I said, this is the end of me. This is the end of the war for me. I got out of the Jeep. I could do nothing but walk up to it, saying, comrade, right? that was it. And fortunately, when I got walked up to the gun, the, the American army had already been through that area, and the, the three of the German there were dead. Pretty good feeling. What a relief <laughs> that was, because I was just waiting to be blown apart. Real good time with them, mm -hmm. whining and dining. It's good to see my brother. First of the family I saw in almost three years at that time. We left We left the beachhead, went up north, Bain, Les Bains, Aschaffenburg, all great battles in World War II, and ended up through the Siegfried Line, which I feared from the day I was in high school, because in high school I studied about the Siegfried Line, which no one was able to penetrate. Well, the American Army, we penetrated it. Mm -hmm. I went over to a Schaffenburg just before the Rhine River. From there we had the horrible task of crossing the Rhine, which we did. After fighting in Germany for a few weeks, we, I ended up in the liberation of the Dachau concentration camp. One, <coughs> excuse me, one of the saddest thing I've ever seen in my life. The Germans were, the, they just tortured up those prisoners. They, they were dead laying around by the thousands in railroad cars with no, nothing to keep them warm when they were driven by train to the concentration camp. Many of them were stripped of their clothing. They were tortured and, ga and, ga and gassed. Women, children, everyone. It, that about ended my actual combat in World War II from a week later. And I spent a few months as Army of Occupation in Germany. And thanks to the atom bomb, I would have probably ended up fighting Japanese. Mm -hmm. But the atom bomb ended the Japanese war, and that's when I came home. This is the Nazi flag that I took home from Germany. And on both sides of this are the names of fellas that were in my outfit. Most of them never came home with me. Two of us came home. I can't remember how many times your life gets torn apart when you when you watch your when you watch your your buddies who you live with, you ate with, you watch them die next to you. And uh, I also had gotten by reading the army newspaper on the Anzio beachhead where my nephew was shot down in France and killed. Mm -hmm. Well, that always bothered me because they never told me from back home. Mm -hmm. And I never told them I knew it. Mm -hmm. So that was the, probably the saddest part of my life. My nephew was maybe a year younger than I was. Mm -hmm. And he was flying a plane in France when he was shot down. Mm -hmm. and. It's a horrible thing to come home, knowing you come home. Mm. Why am I coming home as a, as a younger fellow than me? Why didn't he come home? I, and I had approached my brother-in-law and my sister, and I just never forgot it. Mm -hmm. it, 
it's, it's, it seems like it's not fair. It's not fair why this one came home. How can I last three years and come home? Mm -hmm. Right? Being in a hospital in, over there. Right? Get bombed over there. The Germans had, didn't care about our big Red Cross on a hospital tent. We weren't in a building in a hospital tent with a cross on. They bombed it. And I came home, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. I show it to you all because World War II was my life. 